uh, since I've been given the permission, I think we could start. Uh, yes, o Olga already wrote her own feedback in the chat. I'm just going to copy it and put it in yours um, right after the workshop. Cool. Uh, yeah, we are recording. Great. OK, um, so hi, everyone, and welcome to the next uh, Manchester Advanced Training. Uh, this week, we are going to be talking about uh, debating ad motions. Um, Reese wanted me to make a really funny joke, and that is that when people see an ad motion, they look like the nice little boy uh, right here on the right. Um, can you mute me? Um, yeah. So uh, we hope that after the workshop, hopefully, people will not look like the boy on the right anymore. Uh, so if I can get the next slide. Uh, so first thing first, uh, when it comes to uh, our debates, uh, I think sometimes the reason why people are scared of our debates and uh, when um, and when they start panicking once they see the motion and when they think that the, these debates are inherently going to be low impact, very often the reason is that when people see an art motion, when they think of art, they just imagine the kind of art that you can see on the left, that is these sort of traditional paintings, traditional sculptures, um, that maybe a person uh, in their daily life, a regular person doesn't interact as much, meaning that it just seems as if it's quite low impact. In terms of what actually our debates tend to be about. When we talk about art, we mean things, many more things than just the traditional paintings. We included some examples on the right. Uh, so it can be films like films, uh, music, uh, rap music, TV shows, uh, for example, Kardashians. I think uh, if anyone wants to hear my take about why I think Kardashians are art, uh, I can do that after the workshop, uh, but it's true. Um, so all of these things technically count as art and do have uh, the art. same sort of impacts as, as on people and uh, on, on the way they interact with it uh, as these sort of traditional art would have. Um, if I can get the next slide. So uh, what do people actually get from uh, engaging with art? Um, so we have three broad things uh, that people can get as a result of their engagement with art. The first one is terms of uh, aesthetic value. Um, so this is something we often associate with the, the sort of traditional painting, traditional sculptures, etc. That is, if someone engages with this, they are able to see the sort of technical expertise and they are able to appreciate the skill of the artist who created that art. So you're getting value through being able to explore the sort of details, the colors, the shadowing that that individual was able to create. Um, so that's one way that individuals get value from engaging with art. Um, the second kind of value, and it's quite important, is the, so is, is the cognitive value. That is, uh, you get it through sort of understanding and thinking of the specific message that is forwarded uh, by the particular piece of art. And lastly, uh, there is an sort of experiential value. So it's the emotions, irrespective of maybe the internet message or of the technical skill, the emotions that the piece of art can invoke in you. Um, so on the right, you can see a couple of examples. Um, so the first one uh, is an example of something that can be counted as something that you very often derive mostly the aesthetic value. It is, it's still life, meaning that there's not much of a message that you can get from that sort of art. There is not much actual emotion that it makes me feel, but I still can appreciate the fact this is something that is technically uh, incredibly well done. Um, the second one is uh, a, a, a Banksy painting. Um, and uh, basically what happens here is that after that painting was sold in auction, um, there was a shredder built in that frame um, and the, the painting that got shredded. Uh, now, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, now, the obviously the action of shredding that painting may, means that that painting aesthetically became less pleasing. Obviously, in so far as it's shredded, but the the message that is being sent. Uh, through the act of the destruction of that painting is something that gives people cognitive value, even though maybe aesthetically the painting becomes like less aesthetic. Um, lastly, the the Sixteen Chapel in the in the last uh, in the last uh, example. Um, obviously, there is a level of aesthetic value from it as well because it's obviously very technically well done. Uh, but often, the reason why people really enjoy that sort of art is because of the feeling it evokes in them. That is, you come into that sort of space and you feel as if you are very small in comparison to it, and like you are realizing like your own. 
uh, say, yeah, smallness in comparison to something so big and so so um, and so monumental. Um, so it obviously with most other pieces of art, for example, music, uh, it's very straightforward in a way that it can invoke emotions in us. Um, so uh, just to clarify, uh, the all these three reasons, uh, all these three things, is things that people get from engaging with art. This is not why people always choose to engage with art in the first place. Most of them, people engage with art because of they want to get some sort of emotions from it. Uh, obviously, some people also want to see art because they actually appreciate the message. But very often, the primary motivation most people, average people have, is the escapism, the sort of emotions. That doesn't mean that they also do not get the other three things. So maybe you listen to, a mu to, to, to music because you want to get the experience and the emotion from it, but you also happen to hear the lyrics. You also happen to start thinking about the lyrics as a result. So those are the three things that people can get from engaging with art. Um, uh, why is this important in terms of debates? Um, so why do we then care about making art accessible? Why is it, what are the reasons as to why you should be caring about art in debates? Um, so the first one, and this is what the majority of the workshop is going to be talking about, uh, is in terms of social change, driving social change. Uh, this is mostly through the cognitive value, and we're going to talk about it in length uh, later on. Uh, the second reason as to why you would care about art and you would want to make it more accessible and let more people um, have access to art is because art functions as a status signaler. So what this means is that uh, the ability that I have to talk about art and own art can facilitate social interactions and can impact how people perceive me. So for example, if I go to a new workplace uh, and I have had access to art, had access to art education, I might have read a lot of books or seen a lot of paintings uh, or seen the films that everyone else has seen in certain social circles, uh, this is the way that I get to uh, become friendly with people and people start ascribing me some sort of social status. Um, so that's the second reason as to why accessibility would be important. And um, the third one uh, is because, uh, and this is again related to the experiential value, uh, is that art can provide you unique emotional experience in very simple terms, it can make people happy. Now, uh, it is obviously, uh, this is something, this is an argument that is quite difficult to make, especially to make it sound impactful. Uh, so obviously, uh, the sort of social change impacts, those big impacts sound significantly more big than uh, people are happy as a result of seeing art. However, I still do think that there is a place in debates where you can run the impact, people are just going to be happy as a result of uh, seeing art, and it can function. Uh, the uh, the, the issue here is that you have to be able to present it to the judge in a way that they are going to buy it. Uh, I think the way that we usually do it is A, you point out that this is something that is somewhat unintuitive and it will sound somewhat low impact, but you have to make it clear to a judge that it is not. So I would say something like, look, this, is, this will sound like low impact, but it's actually very important. And the way I would normally frame it is something like, the way I am going to, I perceive my life and I perceive if I'm feeling good, if I had a good day, if I'm generally happy, it's not because like big massive events because those obviously don't happen as often, but it's as a result of often very small ex emotional experiences that I get uh, throughout the day. So when I'm like laying in bed in the evening and I'm thinking if I was, if I had a good day, I often think about the music that I listened to that made me feel energized or reminded me of some good memory of something beautiful that I've seen or some like nice film that made me feel feelings that I would not feel otherwise. So often those small emotional experiences come exactly through engagement with art and it's important that people have it because in the end this is the those small things make people actually happy that those things are actually make people feel good and if you think about it the big impacts like they give people more money etc in the end also boil down into making people happy right it's not about we're going to give people a lot of money it's about that people are going to feel happy as a result of being able to buy more stuff so even if it sounds low impact it is still technically it is it is still incredibly important that we are able to make people feel good about themselves and feel happy in long term through those small interactions. Um, so this is something that you can do uh, in debates uh, about art. Uh, it tends to be useful to do it uh, also in conjunction with mitigation. I'm going to give an example. Um, once we were in a debate that was, it was something like this, House Regrets True Crime, 
series, something of that sort. And uh, we were closing opposition. Um, so uh, Goldbench was uh, just gave all the like really massive impact about copycat murders and um, like all that stuff. Uh, our opening was also running a lot of big impacts about like how it helps police solve cases or stuff like that. Now, insofar as we haven't had much in CO in terms of those big impacts, what we basically did is A, we managed to mitigate all of this, just explain why this just does not matter and the true crime series are not making a massive difference in this. And then we just gave a lot of reasons about why uniquely these things are things that people actually do enjoy, people make really happy, people get escape from it in a unique way that they wouldn't get from other pieces of media, which is why they choose it. And we ended up winning that debate just by saying, just by mitigating everyone else's impact and saying, look, this makes people happy. Obviously, you have to forward it in that particular way, but if you do it, it can be a powerful argument that you can make. Cool. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, uh, you can also put in the chat, uh, unless it's August memes. Uh, cool. Okay, great. Um, so moving on to the social narratives uh, and more of the social justice part of, part of uh, art. Um, so uh, the first thing we want to talk about is the role of art in forming social narratives. Um, so art forms narratives in a couple ways. Uh, the first one is in terms of the individual emotional response. Um, so this is quite standard argument, uh, but it's the things like the fact that I can see some sort of powerful emotional art uh, and I can see something that I can relate to and I can kind of see something that is proximate to me, it kind of is much easier to break the apathy barrier that I have. For example, uh, if I am told uh, an example, for example, the refugee crisis, if I am told that there are people that are dying as a result of having to cross the Mediterranean Sea, this is obviously something that will, I will consider serious, but you may break my apathy barrier at the point where I can see visually, some sort of visual stimulus, for example, the, the, the picture of the dead child was something that many people became invested in the course because it broke the apathy barrier. They became, uh, they, they started to relate much more into it. Uh, and um, insofar, as, uh, insofar as the art is able to, to do it effectively because they're able to actually invoke uh, the emotions. And two, it again, uh, it makes the issue feel more proximate because I can experience, I can empathize and I can feel those feelings myself. If I'm told that someone is feeling sad about something or someone is suffering as a result of something, again, I can't experience that thing myself. So once art is able to forward that emotion to me and I kind of experience it through that art, it starts feeling more proximate to me as a result. So through that emotional response, I can, uh, I, we can influence the way what people, what, what social issues and social narratives people care about. The second way that art forms social narrative is through contextualization. Um, so this happens in two ways. Uh, the first one is that art has a big role in what we believe is true about the world. Um, so if you think about it, uh, you actually have not seen much about the world like in person. For example, uh, like I've never been to say Mexico. Uh, and also when I'm thinking of Mexico, I also probably haven't seen much of Mexico in the in news because A, it's not reported about and B, I don't watch news that much. So the only actual idea I have about what Mexico looks like is because I've seen some films that took place in Mexico. Um, same, can, same can happen about specific groups uh, of people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, often you just didn't see them with their own eyes. It's something that you're just getting from art. Uh, what it means is that the way the art is portraying those places or those people is crucially important. So a couple examples again that are on this slide. So on the right, uh, you can see three pictures that are of the, uh, exactly the same street. Um, so what I'm trying to convey here is that often, if you think of how American films show some particular piece parts of world and particular cities, they tend to color them in a way that is trying to convey you some sort of idea of what these cities and places look like. So, uh, for example, the second picture that is like quite blue, uh, if you look at any American film that has to do with Russia, uh, it's always going to have that blue filter and everything's cold and everything looks sad and it's really depressing. Uh, now, if you look at the third one, uh, and the very orange and very kind of hot colors, this is, again, very often the way that any 
Latin American country like Mexico is going to be just like put the orange filter over it again, invoking specific kinds of uh, emotions um, to you. So obviously, in fact, the street looks like the first picture on the top, uh, but this is something that you um, that you uh, do not know because this is not the way that you see, you've ever seen the street, you've ever seen the country, you've only seen the country or the place through that lens of that particular coloring or the particular effects uh, that the film has given you. Um, a similar example about more in terms of people is on the bottom. Um, so these are uh, screenshots from three films that all have to do with biblical stories. Um, so there is um, Christian Bale, I think, playing Moses, there is a portrayal of Jesus, and there is Russell Crowe playing Noah. Uh, now, I think you probably noticed that all of these people are white, and the, historically, it is not the truth that these actual figures are likely to be white. However, if you look at most representations, they are portrayed as white, meaning that people do just get the sort of impression uh, that those figures were white and they do not question it and it comes as a massive shock to them when you explain when you point out that it wouldn't be true um so this is how um how art can influence the way that we think the world looks like uh, and it's massively impactful right so this is this is something that is crucial when it comes to again people claiming that art is something that is low impact and it doesn't really matter you can point out that art actually has a massive impact in the way that you perceive the world um, and how it functions um, secondly it also influences what you believe is important um, so for example um, if i uh, there are some I, i'm probably going to be caring more about issues that i see to be portrayed more than issues I basically never see portrayed in the media. Uh, for example, representation of events. Uh, say, uh, the example of, say, historical atrocities. There are some uh, events and some atrocities that are portrayed over and over in media, meaning that I am very, very knowledgeable about the how big and how bad those atrocities were uh, and how severe those impacts of those atrocities were. Uh, though there are also some atrocities that never had a film made about them uh, and insofar as school curricula doesn't tend to be great at portraying them often people just perceive them as less important and they don't even know about them at all uh, because they just never seen them portrayed in the media so this is a way that films can um, even though possibly both of these events were equally severe in terms of how many people suffered as a result the way it, the importance of them is going to be formed in my head uh, is, go is, is according to in which case the media or the popular media chose to portray them more. Um, so uh, those are both, of, both ways in which art uh, is able to form the way that we perceive the world uh, quite massively. So uh, if all of this is clear, uh, then I can have the next slide. Cool. Um, so uh, now that we know in what sort of the instrumental way in which art is, is, uh, can influence the way we see the world. I think the important thing is who gets to uh, choose or who gets to pick the messages that get represented in art. Um, so I think the important thing to understand is art tends to be a reflection of social power structures. So the art that gets sanctioned and the art that gets seen is influenced by certain factors. Um, so all of these things, I think how many, seven reasons or something, uh, given below are reasons in characterization that you can give to explain why art is something that is limited to a certain privileged group of people, meaning that the narratives that we then see and the narratives that we then use to inform how we see the world is something that these people get to technically decide. Uh, so seven reasons that we gave uh, as to why that's the case. The first thing is obviously in terms of to be an artist, uh, you need to have a level of privilege, uh, for example, to access education, for example, to gain connections that allow you to enter um, the sphere of art in the first place. Uh, B, uh, you have a bunch of, let's say, gatekeepers, um, like critics, like gallery owners, like museum creators, uh, producers and publishers. All of these people are also because of the same reason, because you need a level of privilege to be able to get to that position. They are likely to have a level of bias of, of prioritizing uh, or perceiving uh, people who look like them 
to have art that is better. So if you have all of those white critics, they are much more likely to appreciate something that is more relatable by someone who is by a white artist. Meaning that again, you get as a result, you get a sort of filtering where only the only individuals who come from more privileged backgrounds get to accept asset access uh, the highest level of art. But lastly, in terms of profit incentive, uh, even if those people are not prejudiced and they are the most fair people ever who uh, have no uh, like none of those biases at all, they still have to appeal to a majority culture. Um, so they still care about the their ability to make money, uh, meaning that they are still likely to prefer something that is likely to appeal to the majority. So again, if the majority is 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 white, and if the majority is is rich and like heterosexual and whatever, you are probably going to prefer art that uh, appeals to those people, meaning it's, it's relatable to those people. So again, portrays things that these people find. Uh, similar to them or would like to see, um, which again obviously filters out certain kinds of art that these people would not want to see or would backlash against, etc. Um, so uh, second thing uh, in terms of characterization about if there's uh, the of the opposite, that is if you want to suggest that even though these problems obviously exist, there might be some ways that different art and, for example, art about from minorities is able to break through um, and, and, and is able to make it to the sort of public conscience. Uh, so again, a couple mechanisms. Uh, the first one is in terms of indie art awards. Uh, so those do exist. Uh, there are awards for um, for films or for books, etc. Uh, that are outside of the sort of mainstream. Uh, and being able to get that sort of award can make your um, uh, can make your life as an artist significantly easier. Um, so in those specific, uh, the, the people who are choosing the candidates for the Indie Art Awards are obviously incentivized to be going and looking outside of the mainstream. So they are actually likely to be able to find an art from someone who would normally not be accepted by the mainstream. And once you are able to get that award, you do get a sort of a pass for three reasons. The first one is because people are just willing to consume your art more. Uh, I, people, A, because people can sort through the indie art and if they find you having an award, uh, this is something that gives them a sign that this is something that is worth reading or worth watching, so they are just willing to consume it more. Or uh, it just catches their attention. Sometimes people are snobby and they just want to see things that go towards uh, and they want to look interesting because they're looking at indie stuff. Uh, this is cynical, but it's also true. Uh, B, uh, publishers are going to think you are a safer bet. So very often uh, when publishers are deciding what, uh, what book they're going to publish, they have to do a sort of risk assessment, i.e. Uh, you're going to think uh, if something is potentially really risky, even though it could be really good, if it may be um, if uh, if there is a risk of people backlashing against it or people not buying it at all, uh, they are likely to reject it. Now, if you have an award, there is already some sort of guarantee that this is something that is going to be good, that this is something that someone has already appreciated, so you're more likely to get published uh, later as a result. And lastly, uh, the critics, that they want to talk about your art as a result. Um, so. Uh, Obviously, often critics want to comment on art that got some sort of awards because they want to explain to people why you got that award. So you're much more likely to appear like in newspapers, magazines, on the internet, or wherever people can again hear more about your art. So that's one mechanism through which uh, you can get, say, minority art um, to, to become popular. Uh, the second mechanism is art democratization. So what we're talking about here is that um, you have things like in terms of music, for example, SoundCloud um, or like similar internet things for, for, for videos like YouTube, etc. Um, meaning that even if the message that you are sending through, say, your music is something that in the mainstream would be hard to get through, for example, if you are commenting on issues like race, etc. Um, because maybe your music sounds really nice or some people actually do resonate with that message it is much easier to get that through to other people because it's because people are now able to share it without having to pay money or without like the formal uh gatekeepers like producers and publishers um having to uh um, having to uh, buy into that art uh, i'm going to check that question in a sec when i get back when i get down um, so that's another uh, another way that you can explain that people can can get to uh, can get to uh, 
showcase that art, even if they are for minorities. The third one is that you can point out that there actually is a trend towards more appreciation of minority art, again, through two mechanisms. Um, I think the first one is that there exists some pressures, for example, through social movements uh, that make people uh, be more conscious about the fact that there are groups that are in uh, are being oppressed. For some people, obviously, there is a level of empathy, meaning there is a level of genuine interest that they want to give to the groups and to, to, to their work that they have or learn about their situation through their art. But also a lot of people, even if they don't care, actually, they want to virtue signal. And even though that maybe it's not great, at least they are, you know, buying things, pouring money, uh, making people better off as a result. Um, so that's one mechanism. The second mechanism that's even more cynical, but again, a uh, lot of rich people just enjoy things that they think are really exotic. Um, so when they do that, they obviously create market for minority artists to be able to uh, put these things through. Um, and lastly, one more, not the greatest, not the me mechanism that is obviously a sort of a double-edged sword, but also the fact that, for example, uh, this is the case with rap music, uh, the fact that white artists, uh, white people, are often or people from privileged groups in general are able to sometimes like whichever music or whichever art the minorities are, are producing. They are they appropriate it, they come up with it. So for example, white people starting to rap allowed for a way of the actual black artists to become more popular as a result because people started to enjoy rap music when white people started doing it and then they were able to start appreciating people coming uh, as a result. Obviously it's not ideal and it would probably want it to happen different way but it's again a mechanism you can give to point out that these things are getting better uh, and, and you actually have a way of different sorts of art to break through. So those are two ways to characterize uh, what kind of messages get represented in art, one of the more cynical, negative one, and then one of the, if you wanna characterize in a bit more positive way. Cool, um, I think that is it from me and I'm going to be um, uh, giving it to Reese. before that. So there is a question. Uh, what specifically would you say makes art relatable to any given person? Why are we more interested in arts uh, that reflects people similar to us? So I guess it's uh, mainly comes, I'm going to think about it and if I have something more and I can do it at the end of the, at the end of the session. But I guess the sort of emotional response that you, that you can get through seeing something that you, uh, through seeing a situation that is similar to yours is uh, say more, what's the word, more intense, uh, right? So like if I see someone being in a same situation that I've been in and I can actually imagine, I'm going to feel a more intense emotional response than if I see something that I can't imagine at all um, and I just do not have the lived experience for uh, whatsoever. Uh, so I can't empathize as much. So this is why people tend to enjoy more to watch art or, or see art that, that portrays people that are similar to them uh, because they can empathize more and they can get the, the emotional response that they are looking for. Uh, I guess there's probably more reasons. I'm gonna think about it and give it, give, give more, give better answer at the Q&A at the end. Uh, until then, uh, unless there are any more questions, I'm gonna give it to Reese. Wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna assume that everyone can hear me um, and I'm gonna move on then to the next slide. Uh, so on this slide, I want to talk about whether or not uh, art tends to reflect the artist who made it. So this is going to be relevant in uh, any of the kind of death of the artist type debates you see going around that are about, for example, uh, artists being detached from their work, either via boycott for immoral artists, or for example, a motion that I think was set recently on preferring a world where all art is published anonymously. What I want to talk about on this slide then is the extent to which art uh, necessarily reflects the viewpoints of the artist and to what degree that is conveyed to the person who consumes that art. Firstly, I want to give a couple of reasons why it is that you are unlikely to be able to separate the viewpoint of the art uh, of the artist rather from the art to a large extent and why that might even be to a larger extent than if you were to just, for example, I don't know, talk to that artist or read a written statement uh, by them. Two reasons for this. The first is going back to what we said about art being an experiential medium. That is, art isn't just the underlying message, 
but it is presented to you in a charged way. That is, as we mentioned uh, early on in this workshop, there are lots of techniques that artists use to make you feel a particular way about a piece of art that you're consuming. In music, they might choose the key that they are using. They might choose some color schemes, for example, in painting. Maybe in films, they do things like choose camera angles, uh, lighting techniques, and so on. What that means is that when you're consuming a piece of art, you aren't just consuming the message um, that the artist has underlying that art in a dispassionate way that you can rationally evaluate and decide whether or not you can agree with it, but also unknowingly to some extent you are consuming also the emotional associations the artist thinks that you should have uh, with respect to that message as well. And that means that if you see lots of art with a similar message, it's likely that you will start to associate certain feelings with that message, even if you never intended to. Secondly, I think elements of art often go unnoticed and you don't question them. That is, there is a primary object or message in that art that you will focus on. For example, in a book or a movie, it might be the narrative of that, uh, the plot of that story that you think is important. There are lots of things that are contextual. Uh, for example, the background world uh, and the other characters being portrayed in that movie that you probably don't question too much. You kind of think of them as being there, but not particularly important and therefore not worth your scrutiny. However, those are background characteristics that will influence your perception of what the world should look like. They will tell you, even if it's a fantasy world, what it is your expectations of the world should be. And this goes back to what uh, Lucy was saying earlier about uh, art contextualizing the world we live in. Secondly, even outside of your questioning, these are characteristics that are hardly ever questioned even by anyone else. Art critics too will focus on the primary message, movie reviewers will as well. They probably won't talk about those background characteristics and therefore you will view them as something that is objective and that is reasonable. However, all of these background characteristics are things that convey certain uh, beliefs or positions of the author because they tell you what the author believes is a reasonable representation of, say, the world that they are portraying. So to give an example for this, uh, for example, on the right uh, in the top, you'll see a photo of uh, Cho Chang from the Harry Potter series that whilst I think most people don't question this to some extent, is an example of awful levels of representation uh, for Asian characters within that film, in which JK Rowling has very few characters from that background, gives them very stereotypical names, and honestly not much character either outside of their interactions with the protagonist. What that means is that the perception you have of these people, if you build that just from the worlds that JK Rowling has constructed, is probably a, not very accurate, and B, not that great. To the extent then that you're not questioning these background characteristics, but rather just internalizing them, especially for something that's children, uh, children's media, as in this example, that can be something that's quite damaging in terms of our inability to separate art from the artist who produced it. Thirdly, on our inability to separate art from the beliefs of the artist that produced it, it is worth noting in art debates that, of course, being in a position to produce and sell art is something that will empower the artist. Uh, I think this happens in broadly two ways. Firstly, it obviously happens in, in the sense that they are getting paid and therefore they are often getting status in the form of wealth. Uh, if they are wealthier, then they have more capacity to spread their own beliefs in society. For example, lots of people follow, probably follow JK Rowling's Twitter account where she says, some pretty terrible things. Uh, and they do that only because of the wealth and the status she got as an author through the medium of her art. Secondly, though, I think the way we represent artists is often, uh, often overlooks the severity of immoral actions or beliefs that they may have taken or have had. Uh, the reason that this is true is we often say things like, this is an artist who did a bad thing, but you know their films or their art are so good that we're gonna keep consuming them. Whilst this might seem like superficially you are recognizing that the artist took immoral actions, the problem is that you are implying that those immoral actions, whilst bad, aren't so bad that they can't be weighed up against the claim that the movie you're watching or the song you're listening to is just really good and you enjoy it. This tends to mean that we undervalue the severity of those immoral actions, both in terms of how we think about them in discourse, but also in terms, therefore, of how we treat the victim if we're going to leave those people in positions of power. Um, having said that, um, there is 
uh, some degree of reasoning you can give as to why art might be separated to some extent from the artist. So obviously, if you're in one of these death of the author motions and you're on the other bench, you might need to be able to make an argument to this extent. Um, I think the way in which you can make this argument is to claim that art doesn't just get controlled and the message you perceive from it isn't only controlled by the intent of the artist, but rather when we consume art, we consume it in a general climate of the social interpretation. We often know what society thinks to some extent about that piece of art and think and what society thinks we should think about it. And therefore we are predisposed to have similar viewpoints to say the people around us and in our social circles, because we're already predisposed to believe similar things to them. What that means is that when we view particular pieces of art, it might well be that we're able to get away from the interpretation that the author intended and reinterpret that art via other mechanisms. So to give an example, if you are opposition on the motion, this house believes that social movements should not adopt works of art as symbols where the artist doesn't identify with that movement, um, you are probably going to have to uh, defend reinterpretation of some piece of art because it's not always the case uh, that you can get symbols otherwise. And then what you want to be saying is to the extent that you need some art to represent you and you can't get it without reinterpretation, this means that you're going to be winning that debate in opposition, hopefully, by claiming that the only path to that representation is reclamation and that you can do that because the social circles that people likely operate in when they see this work already know the social movement's interpretation of that art and to some extent why it's important for them and therefore are likely to interpret it in a similar way to your intent rather than the intent of the author. Um, moving on then to the next slide. Uh, next, I want to talk about representation in art and why it's something that matters um, so that you see, for example, people like you represented in art. Um, the first reason, uh, well, the broad category of reasons actually, is touching back on something we said again very early in the workshop. What you see in media reflects what you think the world is like and what the world ought to be like. I think this has a couple of consequences in terms of why representation is important. The first is that representation is often something that dictates what path through life you think are viable for you, I think in two ways. Firstly, even when you're at the stage where you're considering what kind of path through life you might take, one has to be aware of what your options are. And that means you have to already have had it normalized to some extent that people like you can take that option for it to be something that you seriously consider. Secondly, though, for lots of the big decisions you make in life, for example, career paths, etc., taking that path often entails some degree of risk. And you need to have normalized for yourself, therefore, that you are going to overcome that risk and actually be successful in reaching your career. And what that often means is that representation is important because it provides to you some extent reassurance that you are not the only person like you who's taken that path, that it's not impossible that you would succeed, but rather other people who are like you have gone through that path and have succeeded. I would note as well, even if the characters that you're seeing are fictional ones, I don't think this removes the power of this argument, because often this isn't something that's happening at the rational level, but rather at the kind of subconscious level where you're just internalizing these notions. And therefore, even the fictional uh, narratives that represent characters who you can identify with are enough for you to uh, access that emotional response. Secondly, in terms of why representation matters, uh, your representation in media forms expectations of how it is we should act. Again, we don't interact in person with very many people in comparison to the number of people we see in media, uh, especially in the number of situations in which they'll act. That means lots of how we learn to act actually comes from example from television media or from film. I think there are a couple of examples I can give then to illustrate why it is that certain kinds of representation might be important in allowing for certain kinds of behavior. The first is that if you are, for example, a child in school and you're reading books, you will see a difference in which uh, genders are likely to be protagonists in that story. Male protagonists are far more common than female ones. And what that means is that as a boy reading that book, you're likely to, intern you're likely to identify with the protagonist more and therefore uh, feel like issues that are pertinent to you are worth discussing more, that it's okay for you to take up space because you see in media that your issues are something that's important. In comparison, uh, if you are a girl in school 
and you are attempting to identify with protagonists, you're going to find it far harder to find protagonists that you can as strongly identify with. And what that means is you're likely to internalize more so the notion that issues that affect you aren't worth that space, that people in society don't want to discuss them as much because they're not making them uh, the center of the kinds of narratives that you're reading, that you're consuming, and therefore you're likely to internalize that kind of notion to some extent. Equally, as a second example, there is, for example, in media, some degree of stereotyping of what it means to be LGBTQ. Uh, you see the kind of loud, flowery, kind of very performative LGBTQ stereotypes a lot in media that both mean that to the extent that LGBTQ people internalize the narrative, that that's what it looks like to be LGBTQ, if they don't fit it, they often, to some extent, will end up questioning to what extent they are a, for example, real gay person if they don't act in a certain way. But often also, uh, they will be questioned by other people as well, both of which are, I think, quite unpleasant experiences. Uh, that it's unfortunate that arise and could be avoided by a better representation in media. The third reason that I think representation matters is that poor standards of representation normalize social failures. That is, if it's the case that my construction of what the world ought to look like is based on media, and that media underrepresents certain groups, then I'm less likely to recognize it as problematic when the world doesn't live up to that standard, because my conception of what the world is like allows for those failures. So when I see them in the real world, I don't question them because to me, they're just something that's normal. What that means, for example, is that if I don't see lots of women in powerful roles on TV, I'm not as likely to look at the situation with the number of, for example, female CEOs and question it quite deeply because it's something that I've already normalized. I've already set the standard quite lowly in my head. Secondly, though, I think you often even see backlash as a result from this. That is, you see outrage from casting choices that diverge from what we assume is the default. So we have a default standard in our head that when we don't know details about a particular character, our assumption is actually often that they are white, maybe they're male. Uh, you see this, for example, a lot in books where the race of characters isn't specified. Uh, people will automatically assume that they are white. And when they are cast differently to that, there is often outrage, even if in the majority of movies we still see white male protagonists. For example, uh, so you'll see this on the right hand side, uh, the new Ghostbuster movies where the main characters were recast as women caused quite a lot of outrage, even though in the sea of representation in media, men have no shortage of stories that represent them, uh, just because this is, in some sense, a divergence from what people are assuming is the default, and therefore they assume is something that they can be angry about. Finally, in terms of why representation matters, representation has an influence on our understanding of the past. So this is especially true for things like biopics, things like historical films and so on, because they are one of the most easy to understand representations we have of past events, and therefore they contextualize what we think happened historically. So to give an example of why this is important, um, one of the kind of revolutionary LGBTQ rights events in the US was uh, a series of riots called the Stonewall Riots. These were actually um, an event that were largely facilitated by uh, the Black trans community. There was, however, a movie made, and the movie fo focuses on a white male gay protagonist who goes around rallying all of these people as secondary characters. That is, it takes an event that was really an event about a minority community within the LGBTQ community that was important for them and was constructed in a certain way. And it sanitizes our view of that history to be more in line with what is mainstream acceptable. Uh, that is, it takes it and recenters it around what we see the most acceptable form of gayness being socially, and therefore uh, pushes out discourse from minority groups that maybe need it. These are, I think, all the reasons I want to talk about why representation in art matters. Finally, then, just some key takeaways from this workshop, four of them. First, and I think the most important one, art debates don't have to be, uh, and nor should they be, fluffy or low impact. Actually, art is the primary factor that influences how you see the world, how you see yourself, and how you interact with the world. And that means large trends in art also have large impacts in terms of lots of aspects of people's everyday life. Secondly, 
art shouldn't be assumed to be portraying objective truth because it can't do that. It's to always, it's always to some extent charged emotionally. Uh, the position of the artist is going to matter and the way they try to convey their message is going to matter. Thirdly, it's not the case that access to art accrues equally. Some groups have larger access to art, and that means in particular that they have a capacity to set narratives and to influence narratives based on their own personal prejudices. And this in turn affects what society thinks based on what art we consume. That means finally then that increasing accessibility is often an important impact you can access in art debates for two reasons. One, that more people being able to create art and especially more, for example, minority groups being able to create art diversifies the set of narratives that you have access to and therefore diversifies the set of perspectives from which people say the world, see the world in a way that is often quite positive. Secondly, though, bootstrapping this, if more people are able to consume art coming from different perspectives, that creates a profit incentive for more of that art to be created, i.e. you start to see a market in that art that means you are able to have more artists entering it, more producers producing that art and so on, which often leads to further diversification and therefore, again, to better messages. That's everything I think we wanted to say in terms of the kind of content of this workshop. Um, I do believe there are questions though. Um, so we'll go to a Q&A section now before we have our spa debate. So if anyone has any questions, please drop those in the Zoom chat um, and we will start to answer them. So first, um, there is a question which is, what does reinterpretation look like, i.e. can you give an example? Um, Lucy, I think you probably have a better example in mind than me on this, given that you said emotion about it. Um, hey, where is that question? Is that DM to you? Or? Yeah. I uh. Uh, so, I mean, there is, uh, there is a couple things. Um, so, uh, we actually set a motion, um, I think it was mentioned on one of the slides, I, 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 uh, that was about the uh, movements adopting works of art as symbols, but the artist doesn't identify So one of the, with the movement. So, one of the examples we gave was there is a uh, painting uh, by George Oki that uh, is basically a painting of close-up flowers, but the feminist movement uh, took it and adopted it, uh, believing that the paintings are basically sexual depictions of female anatomy. Um, so that is one way that you can just take an art piece and reinterpret it in your way. Um, or, um, I mean, like even in a more, uh, say, uh, more casual way, uh, even for example, fan fictions, um, sometimes people take a fan fiction, that they take a, take a story that has like full on just heterosexual characters and write a fanfic that actually makes it more diverse. Um, so even that I think is something that can count as taking uh, taking a piece of art and reinterpreting. I, uh, I hope that counts or that answers the question hopefully. Um, so there are no new questions in the chat. I did want to briefly come back to Kat's question though because I think there's a couple more reasons uh, we are interested in art I can add on this. Um, I don't want to say strongly that there is a specific thing that makes art relatable to any individual, because I think there are probably lots of reasons for this. I do think, though, so the one that Lucy gave was that often you have kind of experiential similarities with the people who made the art, meaning they're better able to recreate your background and therefore depict scenes that are powerful to you. I think there are a couple of other reasons, though, why you as well, why you might want to consume art more from people who are like you. And they both stem from the claim that they are more likely to create narratives that fit your background. So for example, if I'm reading a book or watching a film, one of the things I'm likely to judge it on is the plausibility of that narrative. That's something that's kind of subjective though. And in particular, what I find plausible depends on my background and therefore I'm more likely to find plausible or meaningful narratives that are made by people who have similar backgrounds to me because they also find those narratives plausible. That's not necessarily just about how the art makes me feel, but also just the technical, how I evaluate the technical aspects of that art. So the aesthetic value, i.e. what things I see as aesthetically valuable are based on my background. And if an artist therefore has a similar background to me, I'm more likely to find that art uh, aesthetically valuable. Equally, I think it's not just about the artist's ability to uh, elicit particular emotional responses uh, in you, but also their ability to make you feel to some extent comfortable when consuming that art. 
Obviously not all art is meant to make you feel comfortable, but at least to some extent, art does attempt to achieve that, especially lots of the art we consume that's meant to be consumed casually. That means often we want to consume art that reflects things that we already to some extent believe about the world that we find affirming. And that means we're more likely to want to consume art again from people who have similar backgrounds from us who are likely to give us that affirmation just because it makes us in some sense feel good, even if we're not getting a larger experience from that art because they're better able to convey it to us. Um, cool, there is. Uh, there's one more question in the chat. Let me just read it. Uh, so there's a question about uh, remaking or, or uh, artistic creations uh, and whether they are as good as the original one. I'm not quite sure. It would be helpful if you have like uh, a motion in mind that you could maybe post in the chat and then I can talk more particularly about the motion. Otherwise, I'll start talking a little bit in general to uh, about these kinds of uh, adaptations or remakes. Um, often, I think there are a couple of things I can say here. One, often remakes to some degree are reinterpretations, and you can say lots of the stuff we said about uh, how those reinterpretations may happen, either in terms of, for example, uh, how the original author versus the new author might have uh, the ability to interact with the narratives that we have in that art, or how those remakes might, for example, make recasting choices that increase representation. So I think to some extent, lots of the things we say in these slides can be applied uh, within the kind of clash that I think you're getting at in this debate. Um, okay, otherwise I think we're getting an, a specific motion in a couple of minutes, so I'm gonna wait for that. And there is another question I'll come back when we have a kind of specific motion. Um, so there's a question which is about the alternative and indie arts awards and democratization useful. Uh, the claim is presumably the Oscars and Justin Bieber on YouTube are still the things most consumed. So minority artists are always in the margin. So how would you weigh on trade-off minority artists accessing traditional forms versus alternative forms of their own? Ah, so the point here about these Indie Art Awards, let me go back to the slide, um, which is this one. The point about art democratization or indie art awards is that these aren't something we're saying is the most valuable end goal, although I do think it is useful in of itself because you get some degree more representation and that is a marginally useful claim. But also I think this is useful because this is a path to mainstream recognition, right? So for example, um, on art democratization, on this kind of SoundCloud example, Billie Eilish is someone who originally gets very famous by sharing music over SoundCloud that's recorded like very unprofessionally, like not in a recording studio, and now is obviously someone you know very well. There are examples where art democratization is successfully a path to mainstream media. And the reason is that seeing those videos and getting that shared gets you some degree of capital. And once you have that degree of capital, you're able to enter the mainstream because for example, mainstream producers are more willing to take risks on you. Equally, this is the reason why indie art awards might actually be very important. Because if you're able to, uh, I don't know, win some indie art award, maybe you're an actor and you win an award at an indie film festival, what that means is it's more likely that mainstream film producers might pick you up. If you don't have that award, you're a minor actor, no one's going to come see a movie because you're in it, and therefore casting you in a leading role is too risky for most producers to do that, because they're going to see that as just too much of a risk for their funders to actually want to make the movie. But if you have a series of indie art awards, you might be able to convince those people that, you know, people will want to come see your movie. When they put the posters up, what they'll put up is your name with a list of the awards you've won, and people will want to come see you. And that means it's less of a risk to pick you up. And so this is really not just an impact in of itself, but a pathway to mainstream success. Um, cool. Are there any other questions? Okay, otherwise I think we're, ah, so we've got a, a, an original uh, emotion here now, which is this house. So this house would prefer original artistic creations to ones that are remade. Um, so I think if I were to, I mean, obviously I'm seeing this motion for the first time now. Um, my 
instinct then is probably the key question in this debate is to ask, okay, there are presumably two key questions. Uh, one is probably to ask which art is likely to convey better messages, i.e. am I likely to get better messages now if I make original art creations, given who's in power, or am I likely to get better messages by art motions that are uh, sorry, artistic creations that are, I guess, replications or forgeries of existing artwork. Um, secondly, uh, and I think that's a characterization question that, again, depends on being able to give specific examples and argue why they're likely to be uh, the prevalent ones. You can use lots of the stuff we said on this slide that I've got on screen now, actually, in order to access that. To some extent, I think you can also, in this motion, ask questions about what to what degree people enjoy that art, i.e., what to what degree does it matter that art is original to us for us to be able to connect to the artist and to enjoy it again i think this is as lucy said at the start of the workshop accessing the intuitively lower impact clash but with mitigation is a way to be able to uh, do well in that motion i think in order to say more i'd need to actually sit down and prep things so i don't want to say too much about a motion that i've seen 30 seconds ago but hopefully that's at least somewhat useful are there any other questions Okay, uh, if not, um, hope.